Hello and welcome to episode two of Talking Till Dawn, the podcast where two Scottish guys discuss all that's strange, bizarre and uncanny. I'm Michael Whitehouse and with me is the very tall... Oh, you want me to say my name? <laughs> you know, <he's>... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. uh, I'm Martin, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a lovely crisp autumnal evening here in Glasgow. Uh, the leaves are turning, the nights are drawing in. I'm glad to be here, Mike, recording our second ever Talk Until Dawn. It's a great night for it. Definitely, definitely. I can't wait for Halloween uh, either. It's it's fast approaching, fast approaching. So, um, yeah, that's good. I'll just tinker with my audio levels while we're recording. That's good. That'll work out well. Right, so <laughs> on tonight's episode, on episode one, we were discussing uh, Loch Monsters in Scotland and we were talking about Nessie. If you haven't listened to that, please do go and listen to that episode after this one. Um, we will be continuing with part two of that yeah. discussion next week, won't we, Martin? Yes, we will. Part two and following that, probably a part three. We've got a little bit still to get through on that, but uh, we thought we'd shake something up. Uh, shake something up? That sounds a little bit creepy. Uh, yeah, we, would, <laughs> we thought we would shake things up with something a little bit different uh, rather than start things off with one subject straight for three episodes, I think that would uh, get a little bit tedious. Or as one person on YouTube commented, I'm not interested in Loch Monsters. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know, God each to their you. own. God bless to you. Their own. They said some very nice things about us after that. They said they'd stick with it, even though they weren't into Loch Monsters, Martin. And You've uh, got to have something nice in the nice yeah. at the the top and the bottom of the shit sandwich. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yeah, we we got a few comments on uh, YouTube, so that was that was very nice. Um, so in this episode, it's a little bit like in the first episode, Martin explained that when uh, he was researching Loch Monsters that a lot of that was going to be going towards a documentary for the Ghastly Tales YouTube channel. And we've kind of used it as the basis for the, the research that Martin did. We used that as the basis for the previous episode. So this is kind mm. of the same deal. I have a, a kind of old series that I used to do on YouTube called Real Horrors. And this was going to be a full episode of it. It was, going to, it was kind of going to be a documentary as well because uh, we were going to go out and shoot some stuff on footage but uh we're lazy oh, aren't we Martin? unbelievably so you have no idea how lazy we yeah. are <laughs> new height of laziness so that's so i don't even because have trousers of that on. uh <laughs> that's beautiful what a beautiful picture you paint so because I'll of that jeans. on your but, but no okay right very good i just had an image of you wearing jeans on your head if you didn't have any if you didn't have anything on your bottoms so like uh, the last time uh, with Martin's last episode, I'm going to be reading th through pieces of the script that I wrote for that episode. So some of it is going to come across as maybe a bit overly dramatic because it's a different style of doing things when you do a, a documentary or something like that. But I do have some other notes here as well. Let's be so honest, between Ma you and me, if anyone here has found us through our previous work, they're probably going to be fans of the overly dramatic, let's be honest, Mike. That's true. We are a uh, raging dramatist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this case, it's the case of a girl called Maria Tallarico, and it's a possession case, and it's something that I found online a few years ago, and it interested me because the story itself suggests at least that there were a lot of witnesses yeah. to this and that there would be a lot there was there was a lot of i suppose i mean it's still anecdotal but a lot of evidence for it in terms of if it's true the number of things that were said and then later verified yeah so uh just uh looking at the the script here i'll just get past all of the nonsense that i started with so this the case i'm referring to as i said is the possession of maria tallarico 
and I first came across accounts of Maria's possession several years ago and ever since it stayed with me. And as someone who is agnostic about paranormal claims, I want to know whether there's any truth to the story. Is it a genuine case? Or just another product of internet urban legend, which people have repeated over and over until finally someone tells the truth, as if it were real. Before we investigate the events surrounding these claims, you want to know the story. So, uh, it's a good one. It's filled with murder, conspiracy and vengeful spirits. Love That's the type of, of thing we like, Martin. Love a bit of murder. <laughs> love a bit Bloodier of murder. the better. Love a bit of conspiracy. Yeah. Oh yeah, love a, love a bit of uh, immoral crime. <laughs> There's nothing. So, the case starts back in, uh, and I should say at this point, what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm going to be telling you what the most recent uh, tellings of this story, the way that they document the case, and then we're going to go back and we're going to, we've actually done a bit of research between the two of us that uh, I don't think anyone else has mentioned online or anything like that from anything that I've seen, so hopefully uh, we're actually uncovering some things about it that, that people don't know. Original research so, right here, people. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. To be lost forever when no one listens to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lost in the abyss of podcasts. So the case goes back to February 13th, 1936, to the city of Catanzaro in Italy. There is supposedly a bridge there called the Mirandi Bridge, and beneath it the body of a 20-year-old man named Giuseppe Veraldi uh, was found. When he was found... Quite dead. His body was badly <laughs> bruised. I know. Quite dead. Not completely dead. No, he was dead. Martin, he was dead. He was. His body was badly bruised and broken. Um, and uh, from some of the accounts that I read, they said that his lungs were filled with water, which we'll see doesn't quite jive with certain things. Um, later on, at first it appears as though it was either an accident or a suicide, and Giuseppe's injuries, specifically catastrophic fractures to his skull, are the direct result of him jumping or falling from the bridge mm -hmm. uh, to the sort of stony bank below and then falling into the river and smashing his head there. Yeah, that's good, Michael. That's good. That's some good storytelling. <laughs> uh, after, after investigating the death, the police conclude that it was a suicide and close the case. Uh, much to the protestations of Giuseppe's family, especially his mother, who does not believe for a second that he would ever have taken his own life. But that's, I mean, Martin, that's that's quite common, isn't it, in, in cases where people commit suicide? I mean, people who are, I, I don't want to generalise, right, but, but often people who are at that stage of wanting to do something like that, many times they're people who don't or can't talk about their problems some uh, often i would think um mm -hmm. so it, it doesn't seem surprising that some people might be surprised or emo i imagine most people are surprised when they hear that their relative or their loved one has taken their own life yeah yeah so nearly three years pass after this and um obviously for his family giuseppe's death um looms large but for the local community most have kind of moved on from it but then on January uh, of, in January of 1939, the memory of Giuseppe's supposed suicide is brought once more into the limelight, in bizarre fashion. A 17-year-old girl named Maria Tallarico, and I should say at this point that I am probably butchering Italian pronunciation here, um, but uh, yeah, so Maria Tallarico, she's walking across Mirandi Bridge. She's on, uh, she, it's a route she's taken many times before. Mm-hmm. No reason to expect anything sinister. Okay. And she continues on her way until she suddenly feels compelled to move towards one spot just next to the railing, the place from which Giuseppe Veraldi allegedly leaped to his death. As Maria nears the railing, she feels something oppressive, a dark force or agency descending upon her. By the time she is standing where Giuseppe supposedly killed himself, Maria Tallarico is overwhelmed. She screams and loses consciousness. Bystanders witness her bizarre behaviour and rush to her aid. But instead of being taken to a hospital, the bystanders, some of them know Maria's family, I would assume because it's a small community, uh, they realise that she's breathing, yeah. but unconscious. They think she's fainted 
and they take her back to uh, her family home nearby. When she's there, she seems to be in some sort of... Um, she's in an unconscious state and when she does finally wake and people ask her what had happened, she replies but not in her own voice. Instead, in the low, rasping voice of a man. Mm. Perplexed, her family and neighbours attempt to address her, but she refuses to answer to her own name, Maria. When finally asked by her own mother, what is your name then, Maria answers, again in the strange male voice, you are not my mother, my mother is Caterina Veraldi. I am Pepe. I'm assuming why, Pepe's why have short I, why have for I Giuseppe. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so this revelation causes a great st stir amongst uh, Maria Tallarico's family and neighbours. And I think, Martin, you, you at first you'd probably just... I mean, certainly if this happened now, you would instantly go to mental health issues, wouldn't you? Yeah, you. I think if that happened now, you, would, the, you wouldn't you would just take them home. The, you would make sure yeah. that an ambulance was called, you'd get them to a hospital, you'd get them seen by a professional but you know it's a different time uh, yeah. I don't know what the situation was in well I don't know what the situation is in Italy now with healthcare but I don't know what the situation was then in terms of you know hospitals and, and um, medical fees and all of that just kind of throw thing. them so, in a ditch throw <laughs> them in but, a ditch but maybe you know maybe that was just the done thing then that you, you took people home when they you know when they took a turn for the worse I mean up until that point it certainly seems fairly normal well not normal but it seems like she has had a seizure of some kind or so after Katerina claims to be Pepe or Giuseppe and she's uh, using his voice and she's mentioned the name of her mother Katerina so this obviously causes quite a stir among uh, Maria's family and neighbours and they wonder has their dear sweet Maria been possessed by the suicidal spirit of Giuseppe Veraldi. Now, I, I wonder at this point, Martin, you know, we, we possession is something that's always in it, not always in our mind, obviously, but it's something that's in popular culture, primarily because of the film The Exorcist more than anything. Yeah. And I do wonder how quickly people back then would have would have jumped I think to got possession. To yeah, I think you've got to remember that Italy is and was a very Catholic country and that these people probably were surrounded by lore and belief in an afterlife in spirits. I don't want to imply that, that townspeople in Italy in the 1930s would be superstitious idiots, but I th <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. But I think that even here in that time, people probably had a greater belief in the supernatural than they would now. I think people would probably go towards those conclusions faster than we might today, in general. Yeah, like I certainly think of like the whole superstition thing, but I don't know, I mean, maybe it's just, um, you know, I would think more that people would start, if they were going to go down the superstitious route, that they would they would say that it was some sort of witchcraft yeah. Or something like that, well, you know, like... Uh... Remember, this is the early part of the 20th century. It's not that long. It's maybe, what, 20 years or so after the boom in spiritualism. Yeah. And that was all about not possession as such, but channeling spirits, right? That was... Yeah. You could, you could call this... In fact, you could call this case, in some ways, fits better under the heading of channeling a spirit maybe not yeah. entirely voluntarily, but this, this seems to fit under that rather than sort of demonic possession because it's not any sort of mythological creature, it's not a demon or an angel or anything like that that has possessed her, it's basically a guy speaking through her. Yeah. So I think that probably would tie in with sort of common and popular beliefs at the time, but what I think it also ties in with is... In psychoanalysis, which would have been the kind of primary form of psychology at that time, right? Freudian psychoanalysis. Yeah. They have this whole thing of... Um, do you know what? Actually, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later because I feel this part of the discussion that I'm about to touch on now would, would suit 
being spoken about maybe a little bit later on in the discussion after we get past some of what she said. But hold that no hold that thought on on Freud and psychoanalysis because I think there is. I was just getting into it as well. Point for that as well. Yeah, <laughs> we'll come back right, to it. Well, well, definitely. Um, so I do. I mean, like that's I think that's a really good point about uh, spiritualism because even in the thirties, there was mm-hmm. a lot of stuff like that going. On. There was a lot of mediumship still going on. And yeah. I haven't really thought about it in those terms because maybe that's partly because. We are so affected by the sort of pop culture event that was The Exorcist and everything that it's affected afterwards. Yeah, that, that's very true. That you kind of go to that reference point instead of one previous to it, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um. So, yeah, the revelation uh, that, that this is Giuseppe uh, causes obviously quite a lot of uh, heartache and worry for Maria's family. But the only way to verify if the discarnate entity inside of Maria is truly Giuseppe is to fetch for his mother, Caterina. Surely she will be the one to know the voice of her own son. So what does Yeah, always leave it to the grieving widow to make the rational decision in any situation. Yeah, yeah, that's it, isn't it? (laughs) She's going to want to speak to her son. Of course she is. Uh, and she'd probably want to persuade herself that not that's who she's speaking to. Yeah, exactly. I'm not saying it's not real, but of course, you know, on one hand you could say, well, she knows her son. On the other hand, you could say no one wants it to be her son probably more than, than she would. Unless she hates him. Uh, <laughs> fuck, he's back. Like, oh, oh no, it's Giuseppe. Um, so word is sent for Katerina, and in the meantime, Maria asks those present to play a game of cards with her or Giuseppe rather asks for people to play a game of cards Mm -hmm. although Maria knows her neighbours and friends well the male voice emanating from her mouth refers to wanting to play with four of those present as Toto, Elio, Rosario and Damiano witnesses recall at this point that Toto, Elio, Rosario and Damiano were the names of Giuseppe's Veraldi's closest friends. Okay. I just realised the way that I've written that down, it sounds as if they're present at this point. Those are not. the people he um, thinks Ka- he's speaking to, right? Yeah, he yeah. Like it's as if it's as if when Maria's possessed, she's looking around and she's seeing people around her, and it's as if like that kind of warps mm-hmm. her sense of the world and she's kind of grafting on the image maybe of 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 the friends on the people that are around yeah. her. Um, so, you know, G- Giuseppe thinks that that's, that's who would be I mean, there. waking up in someone else's body, a man waking up in a woman's body in a strange place, it's got to be a pretty <laughs> psychologically taxing thing if indeed it's truly happened, you know? Yeah, definitely. As I mean, you'd imagine there's some disorientation, Martin, yeah. <laughs> just, just a little bit at least. Uh, it's not like going on a trip to Italy. No. Uh, so... When Katerina arrives and she hears the voice, she's she instantly says that it's very familiar and uh, that she believes that it is very like the son of her voice, um, although perhaps a little more rasping and, and or guttural. She's got a man's voice. She, My son had a man's voice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So at this point in the account, Katerina starts to have a conversation with her son and our son is he's only really wanting to answer her sort of questions but it seems to me that that the answers are not totally forthcoming mm-hmm. in this account mm-hmm. um Katerina asks Giuseppe like what what does he want why is he why is he putting Maria through this for example and he says that he's been haunting the Mirandi bridge yeah that it that his death was not a suicide he was murdered and not by an enemy or a robber, but by several of those closest to him. And that those people have got off scot-free, essentially. For some unknown reason, Giuseppe refuses to name those involved in his death. This isn't the account that, that I first read. All he will say is that it was his friends, mm-hmm. and that they attacked him and hit him with an iron bar over the head. After that, they dumped his semi-conscious body over the bridge railing to the riverbed below, hoping the police would believe it to be a suicide. Yeah, and obviously this is in the days before CCTV, so you could get away with shit like that. 
Yeah, yeah. CCTV was just some guy called Colin <laughs> uh, sitting, <laughs> sitting in the village, just drawing pictures of what happened. So then uh, Maria is given some paper and uh, one last test is set. Maria is asked to write her name and when she does, the name is stark and clear. It reads Giuseppe Veraldi and mm -hmm. it appears allegedly to be in his handwriting, not Maria's. This okay. is one of the things that fascinated me about this account. Yeah, because that, is interesting. that would be a physic that would be a physical piece of evidence uh, that could at least be looked at. Yep. So those surrounding um, Maria press for more answers. Who killed you, Giuseppe? Who was your murderer? And who were his conspirators? Guided by an unseen force, Maria suddenly leaps abruptly to her feet and flees from her home. The growing crowd chases her through the streets and it becomes clear where she is heading. I think you can guess, Martin. I think you can guess. Can you guess where she's going? Is it pizzeria? Yes. She loves her some pepperoni. <laughs> um, so Maria heads to Mirandi Bridge, back to where it all began, back to where Giuseppe allegedly either committed suicide or was murdered and back to where Maria first mm -hmm. had this attack, this put this psychical attack, if we can call it that. So she, she runs back There's to another the metal band, by the way. Yeah. Psychical attack. Psychical attack. <laughs> every, I know every time we do one of these, there's, there's going to be some phrase, it's like, that would be good in a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> psychical attack. So she runs to the bridge to where her possession had taken hold and to where poor Giuseppe had been muddled. Maria scrambles down the river bank and there, underneath the bridge, she stands, crazed and disorientated. A crowd gathers, worried for her safety. Maria screams in the rasping male voice, Leave me alone! Why are they hitting me? As if experiencing the brutal murder all over again. And this kind of plays into... You know, Giuseppe said that he was haunting the bridge. Yeah. You do get these uh, residual hauntings that people talk about that sort of seem to loop a moment, quite often the moment of death. The TC Lethbridge uh, stone tape idea, right? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Um, and we can definitely do a, a, a full episode about the stone tape theory. Um, it's pretty interesting, although a bit far-fetched, but it's interesting. Yeah. So... Maria seems to be re-experiencing what happened to Giuseppe. Then through the crowd, Caterina Veraldi, Giuseppe's mother, appears. She knows the all-too-familiar location beneath the bridge mm -hmm. because it's the very spot where her son's broken body was found. As Maria relives Giuseppe's death, Caterina takes pity on the girl and cries out her son's name, commanding him to leave Maria alone. God. It is at this moment that Maria's own voice returns to her and the invading spirit of Giuseppe vanishes. I'm sorry, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> when questioned afterward, Maria has no recollection of the events. Those present at the time uh, and reading the story afterward, which was allegedly, at this point, uh, spread around newspapers in Europe at the time, um... Some believe the spirit of Giuseppe was real. Yeah. Well, others believe Maria was possessed by a demonic creature pretending to be Giuseppe. Yeah, this story, as it plays out, doesn't really seem to have any... There doesn't really seem to be any malevolence involved no, in the supposed possession. No, there, no, there doesn't. There doesn't. Um, however, possession cases are... They are littered with alleged trickster entities and even looking at and again I'm, I'm no I'm no biblical scholar but my understanding is that uh, in the bible these things are not people okay you know the, these these things are seen to be demonic entities that have probably been cast out okay but but you know the way this then plays out which we've not touched on yet but the way this is gonna play out doesn't seem to bear out the idea of this being someone trying to lead people astray Let's put it that way. No, that's true. That is that is very true. So yeah, so as Martin says, the story does not end there. While the identity of Giuseppe's murderers remains a mystery for some time, in the account that I originally read, it stated that nine years later the truth is finally revealed. 
Caterina Veraldi receives a letter from one of Giuseppe's old friends, Toto. Now, if you remember, Toto was one of the names that he mentioned during Maria's possession. Yeah. Uh, Giuseppe mentioned through Maria. So Toto had emigrated to Argentina not long after Giuseppe died. As it turns out, Toto had recently passed away himself and had left strict instructions with a lawyer that a letter should be sent to Giuseppe's mother after his passing. It's come a long In way letter, since Wizard of Oz, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the letter, yeah, Toto, Toto, uh, as the letter, in the letter, Toto describes how he and Giuseppe, though good friends, had fallen in love with the same woman named Lolina. Toto and Giuseppe's other friends, Elio, Rosario and Damiano, had confronted Giuseppe about it on the bridge. Things had gotten out of hand and after Giuseppe was brutally injured, Toto and his accomplices panicked and threw Giuseppe off the bridge now, that seems like a pretty big overreaction <laughs> <laughs> why why were would the friends be involved in this you know it's a, it's a weird thing well that ties in i think in part to later accounts uh or rather should we say earlier accounts which are slightly different which we'll get to mm -hmm. in a minute but despite getting away with the crime toto had been racked with guilt and so he left katarina all of his property as reparations and begged for forgiveness yeah. whether katarina forgave him obviously he passed away at that point but but we don't really know how she felt about it so yeah that the, it's it's almost this is the one thing with this this account and it's one of the reasons why in the beginning when i was looking at it and i was looking at various blogs that had this story and yeah. even they varied slightly from each other. Yeah, places. once it gets onto the circuit, you know, once it's on the blog circuit, people pick it up from other locations and even just in the process of translating it into their own words, some details become slightly altered. And I guess over the over the course of multiple transitions, it, it changes, cons you know, considerably. Yeah, de definitely, definitely. And and this is part part of it as well is that it's it's, it reads like a short story, like with, it with, does. like a totally contrived, you know. Big, you know, there's a mystery element, and the mystery element is is resolved and under in dramatic form, and it's all tied up neatly at the end. So when you read these things, that is part of why it's so compelling, though. Yeah, the, the fact that it does have that structure to it. Yeah, in part, yeah, definitely. But uh, like. I mean, as much as me and Martin always say that, you know, we're, we're, we try to be open-minded about these things, but when you're reading, when I was originally reading this account, I started thinking, well, it might be interesting to do something about this, which would be, which which would look at the creation of a myth online. Yeah. A little bit like some creepypasta or sort of uh, internet folklore. Yeah. But there are other things about the account which, which, kind of uh, bothered me the sheer number of witnesses that are in the story to begin with those who interacted with maria while she spoke in that strange rasping voice could number into double figures at least yeah uh giuseppe's own mother identified his voice and the physical evidence of maria signing giuseppe's name in his handwriting i suppose if you want to look at this from a, a kind of charitable point of view you could say that some of the variances in stories, not all of the variances, because some that I think you're about to come to are really hard to explain away, but yeah. some of the variances could simply be that there are so many witnesses that everyone takes away a slightly different version of the story that something ah, did happen. Yeah, that's you true. could look at it that way. I don't look at it that way, but yeah. you could look at it that way. Yeah, definitely. And and also, um, and we'll find out about this in a moment, about where the story supposedly comes from in uh, some of the accounts, it says that the that many papers in Europe picked up the story at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that people were changing the story, or but anyway. So like at this point, I genuinely believe this was something that had been come into creation just in the last few years, and then had been passed around as this real genuine case. So you thought it was fake, but just a recent fake. Yeah, yeah, essentially, um, but. I think the thing that made me look into it in more detail was, like I said, just just that if there was any truth behind at least the account of it, yeah. it was 
it seems interesting to me in terms of possession cases because there are so many people involved. Exactly. Quite often with possession cases, we hear about people being, uh, they're often, say, a, a, a child and the only people that are dealing with them are maybe the parents, maybe a, maybe some sort of a religious person or priest. Yeah, so you're getting a biased version of events. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, this, that, that, this is as well, but... You know, it, it just it interested me that you know if you could if you could find if you could find accounts from those other people. Yeah, you could compare them and yeah. see. Yeah, exactly. So when I was researching this, um, you know, this is what I was trying to find out if it was a tall tale or grounded in any sort of fact, and and how could we know? So I did some research uh, and found that the story had been circulated around the internet for several years. A handful of blogs had recounted the events. Not many. This isn't this isn't a popular story. This isn't one that's been thrown around in many, many, many different places. But but a few, a few. And that again is something that makes it an attractive story because yeah. it's not widely discussed. And it, and it's that that old thing that if an alien landed once, you know, if a spaceship landed one time and that was the yeah. only time. The people who saw that are going to be lumped in some obscure UFO report with all of the rednecks who claim they got probed. Yeah, definitely. You need to look through all that crap just to see if there's anything that might stand out. So, yeah, it makes sense to look through these weird old forgotten obscure ones because there might just be something there that that's mind-blowing, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think it is I think it is good to have to try and have an open mind movement, but, but be critical about these things as well. This is the the problem sometimes people get swept up in these things but yeah but i think that that yeah the mystery element and the the the, the tantalizing little breadcrumb trail that makes you think that mm, maybe there's at least something in the story initially yeah. even if it wasn't possession and maybe it was possession who knows but so anyway i i saw that it was in a few blogs that and it had been it'd been shared a few times um but all the blogs they had the same general story but what was interesting about it was that the story sort of altered between mm -hmm. blog entry so names and event and events changed yeah depending on which website the order of events changed sometimes and yeah even some new details were added such as maria jumping from the bridge surviving the fall but really? having the same fractures in her legs oh god right just i didn't i never saw i mean i didn't look into this as much as you i wanted to kind of stay moderately fresh yeah. on it although when you first told me the story i did do a thing that i often find myself doing when i hear of like a new case like this and that's i pull up old newspapers online i pull up google books yeah and i try to look yeah. back yeah, but and i won't yeah i won't i won't blow that too soon but I, well we we'll, we we'll, yeah, we'll get to that. I like to find yeah, the earliest yeah, reference, definitely. you know. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, what was funny as well is it took you two seconds to find something <laughs> uh, really important. <laughs> and it didn't happen looking into it for ages. I think sometimes just a fresh um, pair of eyes, you know, you look in a different direction and yeah. you see something. Yeah. Um, so, that, I mean, that that's actually really good, uh, what you found, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so just at this point, yeah, so there was... There was changes. That was an interesting one. You know, did Maria jump from the bridge? Did she have similar injuries to Giuseppe, but she survived? That kind of, that kind of ties into old stories and even some more recent ones about like things like poltergeist attacks sure. or, or rather like, like um, supernatural attacks where people are in environments and they say they end up with like a mark in their arm. And then part of the story is that, oh, well, there was someone here that had that wound. Yeah. Right. You know, that, that sort of thing. So th there seems to be discrepancies between different accounts, and this is just the more recent ones. Yeah. Which, like you suggested, Martin, it's difficult to know, is that because people are telling the same story and people just kind of exaggerate things and add things or get things wrong? Or is it because the story is just completely fabricated? Yeah, are they pulling information from different, like, previous sources that all don't agree with each yeah. other? That's... Most of these, yeah, because most of these pages wouldn't cite where they found the story. Yeah. And that's all, that is a problem when you're looking at this kind of thing. Because yeah. often you're dealing with people who don't necessarily see the value yeah. in that. Definitely. 
but it's really valuable. It's really valuable if you take this at all seriously. I mean, often people who are really, really into the paranormal and are ardent believers in it, they will not be happy if they don't think you're taking it seriously. But to me, taking it seriously involves going, okay, I'm going to apply some rigor to that. That's taking it seriously. Yeah. That's going, this could be real. I'm going to actually look into it rather than just accepting it on faith, you know? Um, because especially if you can clearly see that even in the versions immediately available online, there's differences. You can't just let that go. You have to, if you want to give this any credit at all, you have to try and work out what's at the bottom of it, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you do, you do. I think the entire, the entire area of of inquiry a disservice if you just start throwing everything in and saying this is true, this is true, this is true, yeah, this absolutely. is true, and then all it takes is for one thing to be shown to be wrong. And then the credibility you have. Yeah. That's what, you know, sort of falls apart. That's why I like to have a kind of, you know, for want of a better word, a kind of agnostic approach to it. Because maybe if one day I did actually find something in any area of like the paranormal or anything like that, if I did actually find anything of, of, of merit, then maybe it would carry a little bit more weight than someone who's like Zach Baggins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Around, you know, on Ghost Adventures. And by the way, Ghost Adventures is insanely entertaining. It's insanely entertaining, but it is hilarious. My mum said something to me that I, I was really offended. She said that uh, Zach Baggins reminded her of me, and I was like, she was like, no. that's, a, that's a compliment. I was like, no, no, <laughs> just no. No, no. Well, I mean... Don't you start. I think, like... <laughs> no, so... Yeah, so at this point I started looking for earlier versions of this story um, because, as Martin said, it's the first thing he did. Takes me a while to get there. Uh, so I, I started looking for the, the earliest version of it because there were no citations at first and I found a couple of earlier blog posts, maybe just a year or two previous, that, that were pointing mm -hmm. to the same web page. Uh, and they were cite and cited a Doctor L Rumble. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I find the name. It's also it's also his uh, his qualifications after it made me laugh as well. It's Doctor L Rumble, MSc. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. I don't know why that made me laugh. Because uh, I don't know. It's the name Rumble, isn't it? They cited Doctor Rumble as the <laughs> author of the original post. I Sounds like a DJ. We just call him the Doctor. Uh, Unfortunately, the page is no longer online. Um, however, there's a on uh, the website archive.org. There's something called the the Wayback Machine, which I'm sure a lot of people are aware of, and that project archives older websites. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so there are loads that aren't hosted online anymore, but you can at least get mm -hmm. versions of them, like snapshots of them. Uh, it doesn't cover like every web page, but you can get a lot because my friend once made a hilarious shark website <laughs> for a college project, and it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen when he was about eighteen or nineteen. And I still, I wish I could find it, but it's not on the way back machine. At least I can't find it, unfortunately. But anyway, the thing that was brilliant about it was that some guy who was an academic uh, who had an interest in sharks got really annoyed about the website. <laughs> Why? I'm not sure if he had stuff about Jaws on it and all that. I don't know. Um, I can't remember. Reviews I, of I, shark I, fin what? soup and stuff. Yeah, I remember that this story was really funny, so I will, I will, I will tell it on a future podcast. I'll go and find out about it again, but it had this shark website. It was ridiculous. Anyway, so... In the Wayback Machine, I found uh, a page which belonged to a man called Sean Olachtnein. Try and say that easily. And the website was, it looked like it was a personal Christian website. And Sean had been posting alongside that written accounts of paranormal encounters, which he believed supported the Christian idea of the afterlife. Okay. So, so as far as I can tell, this site, contains the oldest mention of Maria Tallarico's case on a website. And what date would that have been, roughly? 
Um, I think that was like late 1990s. Okay. I should have, I should, don't know why I don't have it written down here. I've got Did it have loads of like shitty gifts all over the site? Like a uh, yeah. Bart Simpson riding a skateboard randomly at the side yeah. of the page and, and it, a starry, an a starry twinkling yeah. star background. <laughs> Music playing, yeah, yeah, stars swirling your cursor turns into a comet. Yeah. Yeah. So I looked at, I looked at that website and it appears to be the oldest one that I could find. And from there, I discovered that the that R.L. Rumble was indeed a real man. Uh, Doc Rumble was a real guy, a, a Catholic priest, in fact. Um, although he passed away in 1975, he had written a number of articles for an Australian publication known as Annals Australasia. <laughs> In 1958, I'm sorry, I, I did want to say anals. That's below so, even me, Mike. So childish of me, I know, so childish of me. So the publication was uh, in the Annals Aust Australasia in 1958 and beyond. That's uh, since It goes back to 1958. Each article contained a description of an alleged paranormal event mm -hmm. that Dr. Rumble had written. Uh, and there was some interesting stuff in there, but it was... Article number seven of thirteen that he had published in that journal, okay. which uh, caught my eye as it contained a description of the Maria Tallarico possession. So that means we we could at least trace the story back to the nineteen seventies, nineteen fifty. Well, no, this this goes back to nineteen fifty eight. Oh, okay. Right. He did, he passed away in nineteen seventy five, but the the article it's the article itself was published in nineteen fifty eight. Yeah. Okay. So that's 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 not far removed from 1939. It isn't. No, um, it isn't. You know, but we can go further um, back, Mike. They, yeah, yeah. Uh, but at that point, um, the furthest back before you got involved, Martin, was the was 1957. There was right. no, I couldn't find any first-hand account, but the oldest mention of the case uh, was from 1957, and it was in a book called Occult Phenomena in the Light of Theology, written by Abbot Aloha Weisinger. I would like to read that book. That sounds like a really interesting book. At the very least, it sounds like a great book to have on your bookshelf. Oh, definitely. Wait, I've never read that, but check this, check this bad boy out. Yeah. Check out the brain on me. <laughs> the, book, the book also recounts a number of alleged paranormal events, but when commenting on the Tallarico case, Weisinger states that the real reason Toto killed Giuseppe Viraldi was that the victim had been having an affair right. with Toto's wife. Okay. So Giuseppe had actually been having an affair with Toto's wife. So we're starting to get some more information here, the, the further back you dig. Yeah, and in the same passage, Weisinger claims that Maria Tallarico's possession was brought to public attention mm -hmm. by a journalist named Wilhelm of Off Offelterman, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and that the story was widely circulated in the European press. Now, I didn't know about that um, Wilhelm guy. In fact, I didn't find anything about him. But now that I know that, I probably could go back and see if I could find some more. Well, that would be great, because I was actually thinking that maybe what we would do with some of the podcast episodes is occasionally we might do like a 10, 15 minute sort of addendum. Yeah. Occasionally yeah, going yeah. back and revisiting a case. If anyone who's listening has information about things and they tell us or we find out more, we can kind of, you know, add to it. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So so that's um so we're coming to the end of this really because that, that was as far back um as I went and as I could go. Uh, I found no I couldn't find any record of, of Wilhelm uh, online, but that's not to say that it didn't exist. In Weisinger's book on the occult, he seems to use extensive citations to back up other cases mm -hmm, he discusses. Mm -hmm. So it seems possible to me that Wilhelm Offelterman was a real person yeah. and did report the story. Were you able to person. read any of that book or did you? could you only see that the yep. book existed? Yeah, no, 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 I, I did find it. Um, I did find, at least I found extracts from it. Yeah. Um, I think there may have been a scanned copy on Google Books, but I, I can't uh, I can't actually remember because it was a few years ago that I did the research for this. Now, yeah, but I de but I definitely uh, was able to read sections of it, and certainly the part about Maria Tallarico. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to just before we were going to record this podcast, and um, 
I mentioned the case to you, Martin, and you actually found something really, really interesting. You found an earlier uh, entry, didn't you? Well, first of all, what I did was instead of using Maria Tallarica's Taller, Maria Tallarico's name, I used the guy's. What's the guy's name again? Giuseppe Veraldi. Okay, so I used Giuseppe Veraldi's name and I searched that. That brought up, first of all, it brought up a book on Google Books uh, whose title translates to Spiritism dot 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 This Mystery. Okay, that was from 19... <laughs> what title yeah, that is? But it was in Italian. Um, it was written by a priest, and I didn't take a note of his name. I'd need to search again and try and find it. But it was in Italian. It was written by a priest. It wasn't Dr. Rumble, was it? It wasn't Dr. Rumble, no. It was written by an Italian priest who I believe was also a... He was also a seismologist, so it could be one of Dr. Rumble's uh, pen names. You know, the whole, you know, earthquakes and all that shit. But yeah. I, yeah, I can't for the life of me remember the guy's name. But the, the, tran the title translated to Spiritism, This Mystery. I couldn't see the text. Sorry, a huge lorry's just driven past the front of my flat, so you guys can probably hear that. That's fine. I've got a screaming child <laughs> in my house, Martin. People are going to have to put up with that. They can put put up with a, a rumble. It's Dr. Rumble! A rumble. <laughs> hey, if it was, if it was Dr. Rumble! <laughs> um, yeah, so I couldn't read the text of it. The text wasn't on Google Books. But then, going back further and looking into some websites that let you search old newspapers, I found... A newspaper clipping, basically, from the year after this case is supposed to have happened. So, 1940, I believe. Um, now, the case, basically, the, the, the clipping basically right. recounts the story as we have it, as we understand it now. But it includes a few different details that actually shed some more doubt on the story, I would say. Um Basically, what I wanted to do, I wanted to go back. The reason I wanted to find the earliest reference to this, and the reason I tend to do that when I hear of a new case like this, is because it lets you see what the provenance is, right? It lets you see if, if anything has been added over the years, if anything's been taken away, if anything has been re-emphasized for whatever reason in new accounts, right? And the one thing I noticed about this was the earliest version that I could find was published the year after the supposed possession. Yeah. Which at least does show that it's not a recent internet invention, right? And it's not, it wasn't invented in the 50s or 60s. But it seems to have been published in a, a sort of Ripley's Believe It or Not type section of an American newspaper. I believe it was the, what was the name of the newspaper? It was the Pittsburgh, it. Uh, the Pittsburgh Sun Telegraph from Pennsylvania. Okay. So this is a kind of a light-hearted page with some other fluff-type stories on it. And some of the details were different, uh, most notably that at this point, again, this is only a year after the actual possession is supposed to have taken place. The perpetrators were already wanted by police. Now, that doesn't jive with the story Mike's just told, because in the version Mike's just told, it wasn't until nine years later that the guy, one of the murderers, came forward to admit that he'd done it. In this version, she actually names the yeah. killers. And they're wanted by police. The fact they're already wanted by police suggests that the, the whole fact of the guy coming later, many years later, and admitting that never happened. That This would suggest that at least that part of the story is incorrect. Now, why would anyone make up that part of the story? Because that part of the story is the part that means the spirit didn't actually solve its case. So someone would have had to add that part later to actually subtract from the story. They're saying that the ghost didn't solve it. The guy eventually came back years later and just confirmed roughly what the, the spirit was saying. The earliest versions didn't have that. The earliest version, she simply came out and, and told it. So I just thought, I thought that yeah. was interesting. It also mentions that this case was heralded as a miracle throughout that whole region of Italy, which would suggest that we might find the names Maria Tallarico and everyone else involved in Italian newspapers from around the same time. But yeah. I couldn't find anything about the case in Italian until the 1950s, until that, that book in the 1950s. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't prove that there 
wasn't reports about it in the Italian newspapers. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? But yeah. it's interesting that it's not this widespread thing that it's claimed to be. What it reminds me of a little bit is um, the Angie Cooney Lake case, Mike, right? So what this is is something yeah. that I remember reading this as a child in a book called... It's a doozy. It's a doozy. In a book called The World's Greatest UFO Mysteries, right? Now, the story presented as fact uh, was about a group of trappers who are heading for a village on the edge of Angie Cooney Lake in uh, North Canada. As they travel there, they see bright lights in the sky flying in the direction of the village. When they arrive, the village of supposedly 2,500 people is completely deserted. The graveyards are empty, the sled dogs are dead, the whole town is gone, right? The implication being that they've been killed or kidnapped by aliens. They're going to say, Toto to did it! Toto did it! Toto, <laughs> fucking bastard. This was a mind-blowing terrifying story to me as a child yeah. as an adult with the benefit of the internet you know i can dig into the story a little bit and find that there was never a village of that size in that location the royal canadian mounted police have no record of any of this the story actually seems to be made up from whole cloth by a reporter in the 1930s so with each retelling thereafter simply adding more details to that original invented story and, you know, really over that, a small kind of interest piece in a newspaper probably just made up to fill a little bit of extra newsprint space. About a handful of people going missing just snowballed until it became this massive lie involving UFOs and a whole town disappearing. Yeah. Obviously, there was a time when a reader would have absolutely no means of verifying a story beyond what the newspaper said. You know, your average reader would not be able to confirm this. They would just take it as fact. The very fact that also that a story existed for such a period of time also seems to kind of add credibility to other writers to sometimes repeat and elaborate on that story later on. You know, people can go, well, this was written in the 1930s, so I'll retell it. And yeah, when that length of time has passed, there's almost a sense that I kind of don't need to prove that it happened. I don't need to find great sources because it stood the test of time. I don't need to check the veracity of the story. I suppose if nothing else, it shows that fake news is nothing new, right? Um, Definitely. I think there is an idea that that older newspapers, older journalism somehow is is better than modern day journalism, and I think. Uh, but it it may it, it may not be fake. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm not saying thing. that this was still... fake necessarily. I don't know enough about it to say that. I haven't really done a great deal of research beyond what I've just said, but there are a few red flags, let's put it that way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I thought some of the, the differences in that article were really interesting. That um, So, for example, one of the things that the case didn't actually take place in Catanzaro. That was one of the biggest never things noticed that. that I saw, which is instead nearby on a bridge across the Ciano River. Okay. Uh, but the Viraldis were from Catanzaro, and I think this bridge connects two villages. Right. Um, and that his body was partly undressed when they found it. His clothes were scattered nearby, and that the coroner ruled it not a suicide. He ruled it a death, accidental death. And then there was a large funeral, uh, because he was like a a really likable, popular yeah. guy. So there were a lot of people there, and I I thought it was interesting that. The article made a point of saying that. I mean, maybe it's true, but maybe it's also it adds a little bit more to to it as a kind of morality tale, where if it's like a good man, yeah, definitely. Who, uh, and um, and then also, what else was different from it? Yeah, so Maria didn't know the Viraldis at all. She didn't faint on the bridge, according to the to this article. She fought off being taken right. home, and she was taken home screaming. Um, villagers thought Maria was actually possessed by the devil, which kind of plays into what we were kind of talking about earlier on about ideas of yeah, possession yeah. maybe being different. And I, I thought that was interesting. Um, and that, uh, when the murder had actually taken place, they had been drinking 
uh what's his name giuseppe <laughs> giuseppe and his friends had been drinking uh at an an inn or, or pub and the landlord there served giuseppe on okay. the day his name was giuse and he was also there at the house i think after maria was you've definitely spent more time than me actually reading the details of this because there's some details there that i didn't really pick up on as being different but that's a really some really good points that you make but he he um yeah so he like actually was like a big figure in the story because he was verifying that giuseppe was like with yeah with them and um giuseppe believed that he had been drugged huh as he was usually quite calm, okay. but he got into a quarrel with the men on the way home, and he said that they beat him. It was four on one, and there's, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, again, like you say, it was the the article's really sensationalist, it's like fighting off four men, um, and then in this account, one of the names is different for the men. He names Toto Elio, but but um, I want to say Abeli. Okay. <laughs> A bit Abilly, uh, and Luigi Marchi uh, was the other name and it was Elio and Luigi who dropped him from the bridge Toto is present when Maria uh, is possessed yeah. and runs away but the two other two of the other men are supposedly in the village that makes it a much more of a kind of short story doesn't it that the guy is present yeah. and knows and is probably sweating it out as she yeah. states that he was a killer you know that makes it much more it makes it feel even more like a fictional event doesn't it yeah definitely and and uh maria falls into a death-like sleep mm-hmm. for two hours afterwards and when she wakes she remembers nothing that was that was true and the, but there was no running to the bridge or anything like that um in terms of the running to the bridge and things, what I was going to talk about a little bit earlier on when I mentioned psychoanalysis, this whole Freudian psychoanalysis angle, right? If this was true, if yeah. we could have said that these accounts all chime together and there's this wealth of evidence that this event did happen, is it not possible that she simply knew that he had been killed? and was make, couldn't maybe come forward to say as much, but was able to express it by way of like a psychodrama. Yeah. Because what it resembles so a lot just... is this idea of like a psychodrama, which is something that Freudian psychoanalysis uses to sort of work out psychological issues. Say, for example, because it mentions, actually some of the accounts mention that she would walk on that bridge regularly. Could she have witnessed yeah. something maybe have been threatened or sworn to secrecy. Ah, that's interesting. And then, unable to actually come out, maybe she'd sworn she would say nothing. Maybe she, you know, swore on her parents' lives that you can't say anything or will kill them. And she's like, I can't actually come out and say this guy, this guy, and this guy killed him. But rather than doing it in her own voice, she acted out what had happened as a way of, a way of yeah, telling this really, thing that's, that's really eaten away at her. Idea. Bear in mind, I'm not even very much convinced that this event happened based on what we're talking about but that is another potential take on this yeah absolutely absolutely and um another thing that i found interesting in the the article that you found was that it mentions in fact i think maybe some of the the accounts that i found said a similar thing but but they said that um some of the other men were already dead yeah right so what i wondered if if that was that, if there was some sort of implication of supernatural revenge, there. Oh yeah, I never thought of that. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, just because they don't mention uh, why. And one why of them, dead. one of them fled to South America. Yeah, was he to- well, it's meant to be total, from wasn't it? Yeah. In the later yeah, accounts, yeah. and you do wonder if someone revisited this story in, like, say, the nineteen fifties or whenever, maybe, and then posted the story adding the the section about the letter and all that because it's like you say it's it's a curious thing to add if it's all fabricated it's a weird thing to add to the story it doesn't need it it doesn't make it any more dramatically satisfying 
is kind of what mm. I was struggling to express earlier on. It it makes it less <laughs> dramatically satisfying than the earlier versions of the story. The only reason to add it would be almost to make it seem less like a story and make it seem more believable. Yeah. yeah. Unless, as you say, they're adding in details that maybe have come up since maybe a journalist has followed up on the story found that this guy died maybe they've worked those those details into the story i don't know um but that's just all very fishy i think that whole thing yeah that absolutely. whole thing with the, the the actual denouement of the story has changed quite drastically and that's just a fishy thing and not only has it changed but it shows that details that were included in the finale were already being spoken about before that finale was supposed to have happened it's quite damning yeah. i think yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and I, I, I uh, yeah, I don't know what to make of it. It, it really, you find in that article really put a different spin mm -hmm. on where I was with this because I was at the point where it was like, well, I can't find anything that's super close to the event. Nineteen fifty seven is the earliest, but the people who wrote those accounts seem to be pretty rigorous in their citations and things like that, so that maybe. The articles were, and it would be really interesting to find some of the European articles. Yeah, it would. The article that you found is from America. It, yeah, and you'd wonder if if the has it been presented in that hysterical fashion originally? Yeah, is that you know? Is, is that there the some story? is there some seed of truth to this that has been built yeah. upon, or have yeah. they simply set it in Italy in a country with a different language to make it? to obscure the fact that it's made up you know if they said that it happened in you know Dayton Ohio then one of yeah. the readers in that newspaper might know someone that lives there and ask them and they go nah it never happened it's bullshit whereas okay it's possible that people in America might know someone who lived in that town in Italy but it's a little bit there's a little bit of a kind of a gap there it makes it harder to for people to verify it makes it harder for people to it, yeah. um to debunk it at that time, it would have. So I don't know. I think it's. I mean, it says in the in the account that it's known as the miracle of Siano. Yeah, exactly. So and you search that you search that phrase, the miracle of Siano, and what do you find? That one newspaper article. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's it, it's difficult. I mean, I, I I'm verging towards thinking that it's entirely fabricated, but. The thing, the one thing that makes me hold the door open a yeah. little bit for maybe there being some kernel of truth to something at least is the fact that that book cited mm -hmm. uh, the German journalist. Yeah, I think that if we were to look more um, into this, I think the German journalist is probably the way to go. That's probably the angle that you need. I think that's going to get you, if anything is going to get you to these... European these early European accounts I think it's going to be that yeah it's I mean I find that it's a fascinating case it's, fa it's fascinating how something like this has been ended up on some blogs you know many many yeah. decades later with no citations and if anything the technology we have at our disposal now means that you can you know you can kind of go back I mean, you imagine trying to investigate this sort of stuff when you had to physically go to yeah. different li libraries and archives. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, it would have been so much more difficult. It makes you wonder, though, what else is uh, what else is buried in the vault, you know? If a fascinating story like this, as dubious as it is, was almost lost, really, had not presumably some blogger happened upon it in some old, old book and brought it to the internet's attention. There must be so many fascinating stories that just haven't had that recent rediscovery that are oh, lying absolutely. in books, that are lying in archives, that are lying in old newspaper articles. I think there's still a lot of cool stories. I mean, the thing is, really, what it boils down to is it's a cool story. I like the story, you know? Where even if it didn't happen, I'm yeah. glad we found it. I'm glad we read it. I'm glad we can bring some attention to it. Because... Because I do, th I do think. I mean, my hope is that at least with this podcast, that that as far as I can tell online, unless people have done things since that, that we have found a few things that people haven't mentioned about it. 
and um, maybe yeah. if any of our listeners out there want to pick up the baton, but I'm sure we'll go away and try and do some more research on it to see if we can do an addendum yeah, episode definitely. at some point on it. But it would be fascinating to hear what our listeners think of this, whether they think it was real or not, or if they have any knowledge of, of any of the events, if they heard it before. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, we'd love to hear from you guys. And I think that's that that's a good time to, to wind things down. We've got to we've got to the end of it. I do apologize for being quite ponderous. I'm very tired, Martin. <laughs> I'm very tired. I've been up since five. It's eight o'clock. So if uh, you are listening to us, uh, please do you can contact us if you go to talkingtilldawn.com. That's T I double L, by the way. Sorry? We should maybe spell that out because there's a few different ways of spelling till. Is there? So there's T I L, T I double L, apostrophe T I L. Instantly hit a instantly hit a, <laughs> instantly hit a bump. In it the is road. the most common way of spelling it. Um I do apologize to our listeners if we've talked over each other a little bit tonight. The call quality's been dropping a bit, and I think it may be my connection. So um apologies for that. But if you want to contact us you can get us at uh, talkingtilldawn.com and you can also get us at talkingtilldawn at gmail.com. I've set up a Facebook group as well, so if, uh, I will leave... Oh, have you? Uh... Cool. <laughs> yeah, but you're not on... I, n- I never said to you yet because you're not on. You're not really on Facebook, so uh, that's why I didn't say to you yet, but I, I've set one up and uh, we'd love to hear people's stories and also suggestions for episodes and things like that as well and uh yeah i think that's everything the sun's coming up Martin. the sun is coming up better get that sun cream on what <laughs> yeah. are you talking about i'm what going to bed talking i sleep about, during the day talking shite i think i'm too tired as well good night everyone yeah. good, night. good morning good night good night good night